I got a letter from the government the other day. How been it better than burn that man? The way that I live don't concern that man. We gon' have to settle this another way. A letter. Wonderful. My name is Yvonne, and I'm here with the mass emphasis children's history and theater company that you all are here to see play by today. Um, they are a group of phenomenal children from all different sorts of places and areas and started by um, this amazing young man over here, O.B. Give it up. And um, so, so far, it was started a year ago, and it has been a lot of amazing performances. These children are going to touch your souls today. This is going to be the eighth one. The name of this play is Same Neighborhood, Different Perspectives, a conversation between General Colin Powell and Kwame Craig. And what makes today so special outside of the fact that you all are here, is today is Kwame Ture's birthday. So, um, if your children are not in this theater company, you might want to think about it. I can personally tell you, as a parent whose children have been in this, um, even before the theater company got started, as a matter of fact, that the way that my children have benefited thus far and are going to continue is just beyond words, honestly. Um, how much they're learning, how excited they are to learn, the way that Obi is um, conveying this information to them, you all really need to check it out. So I hope you all enjoy the play today and welcome. Last 34 years of my life. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
apologize for the video. I just thought, before we start, based on the general comments that I deal with that point of view, very quickly. I didn't mean to throw things off. Okay. If my wife is married with cable, I will sing a song dedicated to her called Pata Pata. Oh, 
Brother Colin Powell, I have one more question for you. Would you please discuss some of your military heroes, influences? I don't need to call on anyone else to change my argument, but if that's the way I decided to go, I would have one hell of a selection. Let's see. Any of the Tuskegee Airmen or Buffalo Soldiers, and that's just for starters. I could call Christmas Addicts, Peter Sabling, and of course, Jackie Robinson, who's just as proud of serving his country as he was to be the first African American to integrate baseball. A soldier always makes sure his ammunition is up to par. If you want to go further, our people take pride in serving the best military, representing the best country in the world. If you go into our community, the one thing you can guarantee is you'll find three generations of soldiers living as proud and dignified as they can be. Brother Kwame very well and wrote a paper called 
Thank you. 
direct enemies African people to smash them in the FBI, CIA. Brother Kwame, when most of our people were talking about voting and mobilizing, you put emphasis on non-stop organizing. Brother Kwame, many of our people don't see the danger of men in the body. We are so happy you always stress the importance of being united. Brother Kwame, when you encounter many Africans of genuine anger and energy, you always explain to them, without political education, we cannot defeat the enemy. Brother Kwame, while many activists in the 1960s talk about how in that time we were full of life and prepared for death, you never bored us with war stories. You remain in the front line to your very last breath. Brother Kwame, thank you for keeping the vision of Asahi Yifo and Kwame Nkrumah and Ahmed Sekou to Ray alive. We will continue our struggle for liberation as opposed to just trying to survive. All right.
Thanks. Um, real quick, we throw the guild. Um, before we do this interview, would all the performers come on and take a bow, please? Yeah. of a 
oversaturated United States perspective of African history, the Black Panthers was not exclusively a United States phenomenon. They were Panthers in Britain, Panthers in Australia, Panthers in Jordan, Panthers in Syria. We had Panthers everywhere. So we, there was a chapter, and Kwame spoke in 1967 at the Dialectics of Liberation Congress. My father introduced him that night, so they maintained a lifelong relationship, so I met him at seven years old. I reconnected with him again in 1986 when Libya was bombed by Ronald Reagan. I had attended some of those demonstrations. I had seen him before that in 1978 when we moved to D.C. I participated in my first African Liberation Day demonstration at the age of nine. But I started working with him from the end of 1990 to 1998 when he made his transition. So I had the opportunity, the honor and privilege of working with him the last eight years of his life, which is around the same time that he spent in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which is the most recognized work he did when you look at 42 years of nonstop service on our behalf. So I'm privileged to say I caught him on the tail end. Wow, a few things I learned from Kwame Ture. Um, um, I guess I'm too young to go agree out with you. I'm 43, but you know, our memory is our memory, our experiences are what they are. The first thing that I can think of, I'll start with a basic one. 1995, I had the honor and privilege of working on the National Youth Organizing Committee of the Million Man March. And uh, at the end of the march, about a month and a half after it, Everybody that was involved in it on a national level got a thank you letter from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So Kwame was passing through the United States, and uh, he says, um, I get in touch with him, we're talking, and he said, you got a letter from Minister Farrakhan about the march. I said, how'd you know about that? He said, it's my job to know that. He said, are you going to respond to the letter? I said, man, I don't feel like responding to that. It's an exercise of utility. He probably didn't write it, the secretaries wrote it. He said, are you a member of the Nation of Islam? I said, no, I'm not. He said, now how do you know the protocol? How do you know the instruction? And I said, well, I'm not going to write back. And he said, who do you think you are? And then he asked me, he said, do you have any idea how many things aren't done in the best interest of our struggle, not because of differences, not because of tension, not because of division, but because of trifling communication habits. He said, if you write me every time and I write you back, and I write thousands of Africans back all over the world, you are a baby to the struggle, I write you back, how are you going to get a letter from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and feel you got the luxury of not responding? Get that letter done, young blood. Get that letter done. So that was one of the lessons there. And I think about that in this context. For those of you who know the conversation that took place between Kwame Ture and Martin Luther King on the question in Vietnam, you know that the day before Dr. King gave his first condemnation of the Vietnam War, he contacted Kwame Ture. Reason being is because the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee came out against the Vietnam War a year and a half before the Southern Christian Leadership Conference did. And SNCC had the most militant slogans, hell no, we won't go, and victory to Ho Chi Minh. But out of courtesy and respect, Dr. King called Kwame the night before, pleaded with him to be in church that Sunday. If you ever see the video of why I opposed the war, Kwame Ture and Cleve Sellers are sitting on the right-hand side. And uh, I say to myself, you know what? If that was 2013, Dr. King would have tried to Facebook Kwame, text Kwame, Twitter Kwame, Instagram Kwame, email Kwame, and he still might not have gotten a chance to talk to Kwame. And when we take a look at our struggle today, sometimes people are too busy to communicate with people to do the work that they proclaim platform after platform after platform after platform that they're dedicated to doing. But then when they're called to duty by people who listen to them and are only reaching out to them because they ask to be reached out to, they're too busy to reach back to. So that was one of the things that I think is hilarious. It's, it's equivalent to stand-up comedy to me that we all of a sudden think that we're too important to communicate to the masses that we're supposed to serve. The second thing in relationship to that is he taught me the difference between historical responsibility and leadership. 
I'm a part of what's called Generation X. And you end up, all you see is people, they want to speak like Kwame Ture publicly. They want to speak like Malcolm X publicly. They want to speak like Dr. King publicly, but they don't want to put in 16 hours, 17 hour, 18 hour days on the front line working for the people, the dirty work behind the scenes. The only work you're interested in is being out front in the public talking to you. And you have to ask them at some point, if you're running around here doing all this speaking, when in God's name do you have the time to follow up on the work that you claim you're supposed to be doing on behalf of our people? So these are, these are just some of the things I learned from him. Punctuality, and more importantly, having an objective approach to struggle. Some people, I, I'm inclined to believe their full-time job is just running around critiquing everybody. Can tell you everything the NAACP ain't doing, everything the Nation of Islam ain't doing, everything the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa ain't doing, NAPO, AAPRP, you name it, on down the line, what our hip hop artists aren't doing, what our gospel artists aren't doing. But then when you ask them what they're doing, they'll tell you their job is just to critique us like Siskel and Eva do movies and whatnot. So one of the things I'm fortunate by working with someone of his stature, he, he said, I learned from Dr. King, I never criticize anyone genuinely working for the people. So we encourage people who are working to keep on working, and we're trying to create an atmosphere where we move away from that. As a matter of fact, the only form of segregation I believe in is that frontline fighters should be here, and we can take all the critics, ball them up like a piece of paper, and throw them somewhere else in the solar system. They've been causing too much confusion for too long. Short, but I have a few more questions. Um, my next one is: Did Kwame Ture share any significant words about how to approach the struggle? Um, you know, when we did this play at Howard, first time I ever said this publicly, mm -hmm. and for just for the purpose of strategic reasons. Um, the last conversation I had with him, just out of the blue, he told me, he said, "You know something, brother." He said, if you don't do more than me, that means I didn't do my job. Now, before I get into that, let me just say this. Don't leave here saying that I feel that brother was implying he's the second coming to Kwame Ture. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, as a matter of fact, if you know Kwame Ture, if you ever wrote a letter to Post Office Box 3567, Republic of Guinea, West Africa, you got a response. Like I was saying, communication was one of his fortes. So he communicated with Africans all over the world. And since he felt that students were the spark of the African Revolution, he talked to young people in Trinidad. He talked to young people in what's commonly referred to as South Africa. He talked to young people throughout West Africa. So I think he said that to thousands of young people. I don't think that that was reserved for Obi and Boone and Jr. exclusively. Let me just say that. But I think, but the most humble thing about that is here's this iconic figure, arguably the greatest organizer that we produced from the ranks of the student movement, saying, you got to do more than I did. That means he didn't suffer from vanity. He felt that the work he contributed could be expanded upon. But you see so many people walking around here acting like the work they did 40 years ago isn't going to be expanded upon. And as a matter of fact, some of them have spent the last 40 years talking about seven years, six years, five years, four years, three years, two years, one year's worth of work. In mathematics, that would be called monophony or the math teacher. That's the least common multiple, right? So, I, I mean, um, here's somebody encouraging us to expand, dare to expand on his contributions. And if we stop focusing on leadership, which for many people is a picture the size of a mugshot when you get locked up in Ebony Magazine, um, you, and you focus on historical responsibility, expanding on the work of those who came before you, the positive things they did, and correcting their mistakes then we will be fine. So the fact that he was challenging me to do to do this, and we would have a whole lot of conversations about a multitude of issues. I talked to him, he was present at the press conference that Minister Farrakhan called after Biggie Smalls was shot and killed, where they met with hundreds of hip hop artists. 
And he talked to me about that meeting. He was like, which ones can we work with? Which ones can we talk to? Which ones you think? And I gave him my honest opinion at the time. I said, the Democratic Party got a chokehold on hip hop. Now we can break that, and there's certain things that we're going to have to do to do it. And when you see Dead Press today, when you see Mortal Technique today, when you see Jamiri X today, when you see Amir today, Akir, you see these different courageous artists, we're breaking that chokehold, and it's still a chokehold though. So I mean, um, we know that we just have to continue to do some work. And then what I try to think about is I look categorically at the areas that because of my work with Kwame, I know we work with him. So when I'm doing work around Cuba, I think of work he's done. I wrote a children's play about the Cuban Revolution. He didn't get to do that. I wrote a children's play about Zimbabwe. He didn't get to do that. So different things I've been able to do that he didn't get a chance to do, but it's only because he did what he did that I was able to do what I do. The last thing on this question is he told me, maintain resiliency in the face of adversity. Um, I got a real close friend from Bowie State University when I used to work there, he was here today who helped arrange, who was one of the people who encouraged us to come to Baltimore. And when I ran a dorm at Bowie State University from 1999 to 2004, Holmes Hall. So one of the tasks I had was to organize programming with a historical emphasis all over their campus. And as a result of it, in 2003, the students had a walkout. Students from Morgan, Coppin, Bowie, Sojourner Douglas simultaneously on April 4, 2003 in commemoration of Dr. King's assassination. So one of the things that um, they did, a retired narco police officer from Baltimore, Roger Pullen, ended up becoming uh, the chief of public safety at Bowie, Campus Coco. And what he did is he emailed, he faxed out fly to Homeland Security and he circled my name and said, this is the one to watch. And then about a year later, I, they did not renew my contract there. I had five years and no problem. I get a call from public safety at Bowie State University. Man, the FBI was out here checking on you today. And so I'm laughing and smiling. He gives me the agent's name. I get a lawyer to call the agent. He said, why are you laughing? I said, I grew up in uptown Northwest Washington, D.C. By definition, you're a rent -a cop You're a rent -a pig and you, uh, who I would call the rent pig in my youth, you telling me the FBI is watching me. I'm, I'm happy, that's equivalent to Dr. I feel like Dr. King felt about the Nobel Peace Prize, you know what I'm saying, I'm happy, Jubal. So I'm saying because I had that training and he taught me to expect pressure, expect isolation, when I knew the FBI was coming for me, I said to myself, you gotta come for me because I'm coming for you. This is war at the end of the day. Um, the last question I have for you is, um, Kwame Nkrumah used to, um, excuse me, not Kwame Nkrumah, Kwame Ray always used to say, organize, organize, organize. Yes. Now, do you feel anything, do you feel anything needs to be added to that? Yeah. Um, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, make sure you follow up. We have demonstrations all the time, symposiums all the time, protests all the time, concerts all the time, and we don't follow up. So it would be criminal of me to play a role in bringing Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company here and not ask the people based here in Baltimore, number one, if you feel that this is something that should be in Baltimore, we're ready to start a branch. But notice, we came into Baltimore with Baltimore-based co-sponsors. Our sister Elijah, the unofficial mayor of Baltimore, and Elijah Brown, Dr. Um, Brother David Miller, the founder of Urban Leadership Institute, these two beautiful children, the college, the college, the in the country. And who you know as Habesha, who recently changed their name to I Am. Because what happens sometimes is you have people D.C. is one of those places everybody wants to be heard in D.C. So you have people come, in from D come to D.C. from all over the country telling people in D.C. what they need to do. They might want to build a school in D.C. They may want to do this and that in D.C. But they don't do any research to find out who's already doing that work in D.C. And if they know, they're going to come and act like they don't even, they don't even acknowledge what they're contributing. So we wanted to make sure when we came to Baltimore, we came by showing courtesy to people who labor and sweat and struggle in Baltimore every day on behalf of our people. Being principal. 
So we want to start a branch of mass emphasis here in Baltimore. If you feel you need it, it's needed here based on what you saw, you can talk to us afterwards. That's it, Brother Gary. And he had the hardest job, this brother right here. He had to stay on, and to play the whole time. He had to maintain, let him know based on the response. There's one minor correction. I am a co-founder of Mass Emphasis. It was a bunch of mothers of these beautiful children who helped start this. Some of the mothers are here. They can stand up, please. As, as, Tom, as Thomas Sankara said, women hold up the other half of the sky. So thank you very much, Baltimore. Long live Bobby Terrain. Long live the African Liberation Struggle. And we're glad you got a chance to get a sample of what Mass Emphasis is dedicated to doing. Thank you.